today we're going to be working a little bit slower than usual, and that's because I sliced my thumb open while carving some wood. I do have a new hobby, which is wood carving. In particular, I've really found myself to enjoy carving utensils, things like spoons, and I've only been doing it for about two weeks now, and usually you wear a cut-proof glove, but for some reason I was like, I just need to do a couple more chips on this spoon just really quickly, what is the chance of something bad happening? Something bad did indeed happen. I now have three stitches in my thumb, but let me show you <laughs> what the finished product was to show you that it's probably not worth it, but to me at least it's satisfying. So here's the setup of everything I've carved so far. These first three were quite easy. This is with basswood, which is a very soft wood. But this one is from a hard dry wood, curly maple in particular. And it's going to be really, really beautiful when it's all said and done, especially with this nice little brown part over here. But this wood is really hard. That's the wood that the knife just skittered right off on and sliced my thumb. So I am going to Soul Garden. This looks really big today because I have a waterproof bandage on it. But I wanted to show you a couple quick things on this side before we actually get to gardening on the other side. And that is the Bellstar broccoli. This is the summer tolerant, heat tolerant broccoli it's already starting to produce its first head. This is a variety that produces a lot of side shoots. So once this head is about this big, we'll harvest it out, and then a bunch of little side shoots will come out all from these leaf nodes like right in there. And the grafted tomato took a long time to get here, but it is now producing a lot of fruit. And honestly, they taste really, really good. I don't know if they taste good because of the graft or if they just taste good in general, but this guy's ready to harvest and eat tonight for dinner. There's more tomatoes on the way. There's even new flowers. I'm not sure if it could continue to produce into winter time, but we'll probably leave it for at least a little bit longer. But now we need to go over to the other side of the garden and get some stuff planted. Before we get to actually planting everything out, I wanted to quickly show you what we are working with. We have quite a few empty spots in this garden. In particular, we have this giant empty patch over here, which is where the corn was. That's going to settle for a little bit longer because I'm not sure what I want to do with it yet. But let me show you what we are going to be working on today. It's actually three different little areas all right here. First off is this squash tunnel. This is basically done for the season. There's nothing that's going to climb to this potential. So we're going to be putting some sweet peas here probably. Peas tend to like vertical planes since they have tendrils that will actually grab onto things. They really like a nice vertical surface next to them. But in comparison, if you look like over here, I have this trellis which is at an angle. The peas would work, but they would just go vertical and then shoot tendrils out trying to grab onto stuff, eventually finding nothing. So instead what we're going to do here is actually try to plant some fall runner beans. I have a bunch of runner beans in my back pocket right now, and we're going to plant them on any vertical surface like the conduit here. But also, in between each panel, I have two strings going vertical. So that means I could do one, two, three, four beans on this side. And we're just gonna do that across the entire structure. It's going to be scarlet runner beans. They might not produce this winter, but by springtime, they certainly will. So that's the plan over here. On this big bed, we're going to be filling it with all sorts of brassicas. And just as a quick update, here's the Mexican sunflower, which is absolutely beautiful. The butterflies really like it. This thing will bloom nonstop, basically year round here in San Diego. But let's get back to planting. We have this whole space to fill. It's actually pretty big. You know, honestly, I probably should have realized this, but thumbs are extremely useful. Now, of course, this is my left hand. My right hand is my dominant hand. And I don't know why I'm so surprised, but even things like putting on my socks now is really annoying when I can't use my thumb. So let's see how far we could get today planting this out without my left thumb. We do have a nice little mattock here, which will make transplanting easy. But the first thing I'm gonna do is assess what I have to work with here, maybe do a little bit of laying out, and we'll just see how many things we could fit in here. These are all bigger brassicas, things like Brussels, cabbages, broccolis, cauliflowers. So I wanna give them a little bit more space in this area because this tends to get a little bit less sun as the sun starts to fall behind the house here. So probably gonna shoot for something like a very, very, very minimum of 16 inches across from each plant. And let's just see how far we could get. I don't think I have to use all these starts, but if we don't use them here, I'll probably just start popping them in random places all over the garden. So first up here, we have broccoli early dividend. I potted this up. I had to buy a bunch of starts for a project we were working on, and that was one of the leftovers. I have Sweet Bunch, which is broccolini. So that's when I started from seed here. And I got a random purple broccoli from Botanical Interest that I started from seed. We'll find somewhere for that. Long Island Brussels sprouts. I don't know if I want any more. I already have about five or six in the garden. 
And there's such a long season crop with a chance of complete failure that I don't really want to invest that deeply into them. So we'll see, that's gonna be the last priority. This one is unlabeled, which is unfortunate, but I'm pretty sure it's a sweet bunch, just another double of that. Then we have Waltham 29, a classic broccoli, and looks like another unlabeled one. So <laughs> that's great foresight for me in the past. And then we have red acre cabbage. So I'll definitely throw this in. I don't have any red acres in. And then I have some calendula, which already has powdery mildew, but I don't know what it is, but calendula and powdery mildew here in San Diego, they go hand in hand and it's always worth it because I love calendulas. So I'm gonna do a little bit of laying out now and we'll go ahead and pop these in and then we'll move on to the next area. Last thing to do is just pop in some flowers, which I'm going to do offset in between all these main plants. That way these will flower throughout the season, add a little pop of contrast in here instead of just being a sea of green, we'll have these really nice zeolite calendulas from Botanical Interest to help fill in this whole space. And of course, no bed is complete without a fresh layer of mulch, especially as we go into an El Nino season here. I wanna make sure my soil can capture as much water as it possibly can. And providing mulch will make the surface of the soil more readily acceptant to water. So even though it's not going to be very hot and then I don't have that much evaporation, the mulch is just still a good idea for the health of the soil and also just to help retain more water when those downpours do come. So I'm gonna spread this out and we'll go do some direct seeding. Now that that big bed's planted in, let's go ahead and put in some sweet peas. So these are the Beaujolais sweet peas. I really like them. I like these deep, dark colors rather than more pastel-y type colors. And this just reminds me of a nice glass of Beaujolais red wine. So they smell wonderful. They have a really nice dark color to them, which I absolutely love. Now, if you don't know, sweet peas are peas, but they're not edible. They're actually toxic if you eat them. So you wanna make sure that when you plant your sweet peas, you don't put them somewhere where your regular peas are so that you accidentally harvest some of those sweet peas. They do look different, but I still think it's generally a good idea to avoid that confusion in the first place. And the way I'm going to be planting these right now is I'm going to put one of these for every one of these vertical fence sort of wires. So that's probably about six inches of spacing. It's totally fine with peas. Peas can actually be packed quite tightly and they'll do just fine. Um, if you do have problems with germination on your peas, then I highly recommend you soak them in some water before you plant them out. But in this case, I'm going to just water this very deeply right after we plant these and hope that that does everything I need it to do. I'm probably I'm actually, now that I think about it, I'm gonna go through and put two seeds in every single spot, just cause I wanna guarantee that this fills up really nicely with sweet peas. It's really sad when only some of them actually make it. And oftentimes that's just due to the fact that the seed's too dry to germinate, which is why I recommended soaking it if you've had that issue in the past. So here we go, last two over here. I'm gonna come back through and drop one more seed in every hole, just to give myself that insurance I was talking about. We'll water it in, and then we'll go plant some beans and see what else we could get into. Because uh, my thumb is throbbing a little bit, <laughs> but I feel like I still have some more gas in the tank. So let's see how far we could get today. Next up on the docket are these Scarlet Runner beans. So I really, really, really like big beans. I cannot lie. They make such a wonderful stew, such a wonderful rich broth. So I really want more beans. Now, you guys have definitely seen me complain about growing beans before, but... <laughs> I'm always gonna keep trying. I'm never going to stop. At one point, I will crack the code to figure out why the heck the beans hate my soil so much. But for now, what we're going to do is very simple. I'm just going to sow these beans. Now, one of the cool things about runner beans, in particular, I know for a fact this is true for scarlet runners, is that they're actually a perennial. It's something that surprises people, but they actually make this swollen tuber underground that is edible as well. So it's almost like a very starchy potato that just honestly, I've tried it before. It's not my favorite. I dug up a couple of the first year we grew them. Um, so I'm not growing them for the tubers, <laughs> but my point that I'm trying to make here is that they are perennial. So even if this doesn't do that well, like let's say I don't get any beans this winter, which would be fine for me, they can still survive and they will probably bounce back in the springtime. And that's really what I want. I want a head start on spring so I could get a ton of beans early on before it gets too hot and the beans get sad. So all we're going to do here is we're going to put two in the center of each panel along these vertical lines and one on every single one of these conduit poles. So we'll get a decent amount of beans that way. And of course beans will spread out and sort of tangle up anything around them. So I'm not too worried about getting enough. Now, 
I'm not going to plant it. Actually, I will plant it next to this Kailan over here. I don't think it'll get in the way too much. So we'll get these beans in the ground and we'll move on to the next little task. Before we move on to the next task, I want to show you guys how some of the plants are actually doing right now. This is a row of, I believe it was the Checo broccoli. And all of these were put in, oh, about two weeks ago. This is where my big heirloom tomatoes were. And they're going really, really well. Before I planted these, what I did is I actually went through and forked the soil just to get it all nice and loose. Then I added some neem meal and crab shell. So both of those are good for nematodes. I didn't see any signs of root knot nematode here, but I'm trying to avoid it as much as possible. So I'm fighting it in advance, just in case. I'm not going to play a sort of treat it when it shows up. I'm going preventative, all in on getting rid of these nematodes. So this is looking really great. There are quite a lot of peppers to harvest. We've kind of hit this glut of peppers where we're honestly ready to move on to fall and get some of these brassicas going. This was the first birdies bed I planted, and it had a lot of really old starts when I put them in. They were actually looking purple on the leaves, which is a sign of nutrient stress, but now they look great. They have a lot of chewed up leaves and sort of caterpillar damage, which I'm not too worried about. There's actually one right there. You can see it right next to my pinky. So I'll just, oh, there's another one hiding in the corner there. So there's quite a few of these cabbage loopers and um, cabbage caterpillars, or there's two names, I can't think of it right now. But basically at this point in the year, there are very prolific amount of pests and they, they do a decent amount of damage, especially here you could see the leaf damage is quite severe. But as we get into those colder months, they will just disappear and my pest problem will be gone. So for now, I just kind of accept some amount of damage and I just let it happen. Later in the season, it'll take care of itself. Now in terms of other summer crops over here, we have the eggplant and there's still some being produced. I will probably overwinter all of these. actually had a really good season of Aenea eggplants. These are these really beautiful ones over here. And the uh, sort of long Asian eggplants have also done really well. But overall, I kind of like the size of these a little bit more. Now in this L-shaped bed back here in the corner, I have quite a few peppers as well. And they're being all tangled up with this tomato. Now when it gets this late in the season, a tomato plant has been in the ground for so long, it starts to look pretty sad. The tomatoes themselves even look a little bit sad. Like they're not coloring in the right way. They're not ripening correctly. They have this weird kind of tone to them. And start seeing a lot more pest damage as well. So at this point, sadly, I'm debating removing this, but I don't have anything to put in there yet. So I'll let it live for another week. Now, I want to show you guys this bed because I direct seeded it in a recent video and everything has come up. Even my beans, my bush beans actually look really good right now. So I'm hoping that having fresh soil in this raised bed will do the trick for me because I think part of the problem is that there's something in the soil killing the rest of my beans. But so far, these look great. So let's go ahead and go over to the container section. I have a couple plants I want to move around, maybe dig out some potatoes, and we'll plant in a couple of containers. So here we are in the container zone and it's honestly looking pretty good. I have quite the wide selection of stuff going on here including my peanut plant, which is starting to look sad, which is great because it's almost ready to harvest. That's what it's supposed to look like. I have my datil peppers here, which also just looks super happy and healthy. Very prolific pepper. Next to that, I have the peas that I started in the what to grow video. I can't remember which month I started them in, but here's what they look like now. And they're even starting to flower back there. So that's exciting. I have some ginger, more peppers. And over here, I have some of the broccolis that I did for the fall grow along. So here's the, the Checo. It's looking again, very healthy, very big. It's grown quite a lot in the time since I've transplanted it. And over here I have my direct seeded spinach and a lot of it has come up, which I'm really happy for. But my beans, once again, my beans, they're getting wrecked. They don't deserve this life. But clearly to me, that is like roly poly damage there where they just chewed the entire top off probably while it was still underground. Over here, I have another decapitated one. So pretty sad in that regard. But everything else, like I said, is looking pretty good. I have a lot of winter tomatoes that are doing not bad. I actually even have a couple cherries here to harvest. But what we need to do next is actually pot something up. I forgot to actually start one of these a while back. So I went to the nursery and I bought myself a seedling start because I really, really think this is an underrated thing that everyone should grow at home. The underrated plant in question is, of course, celery. It's one of the most wonderful things to just grow at home. It's it's honestly kind of weird to even recommend growing celery because I think it's just one of those things that most people literally don't think about until they need it. But especially as you get into the fall season, you know what it's like when you're trying to make a bunch of stuffing. 
you'll go out and buy a ton of celery, or maybe let's just make it simple. You, you have a soup recipe you're following, and it calls for, I don't know, something like four sticks of celery that you have to then chop up finely. But you go to the grocery store and you have to buy a whole head, and then that whole head of celery just sits in the back of your fridge till it turns into celery soup in its bag. But the nice thing about growing celery at home instead is that when you want to harvest, let's say you need four spears, you would come through, grab as much as you need. You could take that, set it aside, cook it for dinner. The rest of the plant will continue to grow. It's a cut and come again plant in that way. So just having, literally just having one plant will solve almost all your celery needs for the year because it'll just keep producing stocks. And celery can be a slow grower. It likes a lot of water and it does not like the heat. The heat is what makes it bitter and so it is running out of water. So I'm using a seven gallon grow bag here, but I'm using one of the ones that's lined. That liner will help retain the moisture. And honestly, I probably should have put this in ground or done a 10 gallon bag, but I wanted to try this out in a seven to see if I could get away with it. So I went with the line bag. I think it'll do just fine. I'll do one more in the ground as insurance because in fall, we actually really like making stuffing and that requires a lot of celery. So that's it for today. I need to rest my thumb. It is throbbing a little bit, but I have kept it very clean compared to this little finger band-aid here, which is now completely trashed. So I'll see you guys next time. Hopefully you guys learned something along the way. Thanks for watching.